Father, we're not here because we're good. We're here because we're yours. We see where you found us, and sometimes we think about home. And in between, it's hard. Father, you know the people with broken hearts. You know those who are struggling with sin. Those who have secrets they can't share. Those who are so very afraid. You know the family problems, you, Father, know the financial problems. You know the man who had to have a drink to come this morning. You know, Father, the young woman who's making a decision about her future. and The wife whose husband said he didn't love her last night. So, Father, we're here. We're here to worship you and to hear from you. There's so many voices. May we hear yours. In this place, may we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. Meet us at the point of our needs as you define them. And then, Father, as always, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read a, I'm going to be reading a couple of different passages of Scripture, three or four, really. And uh, it would be better if you just listened. Um, I'm going to be moving pretty fast through this, and I'm going to start in the Older Testament because I want you to see that the Older Testament makes reference to some important things we're going to be talking about in the Newer Testament. And I'm reading from the 62nd chapter of Isaiah, the first few verses of the 62nd chapter. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet. Until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And then in Matthew 26, it's the Last Supper. Jesus has just broken the bread. He's told his disciples that the bread is his body. And then Matthew continues, and he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then in Revelation 19 and then also Revelation 21, there are references to the marriage supper of the Lamb in the seventh verse of the 19th chapter of uh, the book of Revelation. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, the first few verses there, John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things are passed away. And then the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and I'm going to start reading at the 25th verse, where the apostle Paul is teaching on marriage. And then he deviates and says some really astounding things about us, the bride of Christ. Paul writes as follows, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and his church. You've never heard the name Pat Arnold. I loved him much, and he loved me well. He was the last missionary out of Cuba. He retired, and he lived to a ripe old age, and we had his graduation service last year. Weren't many people there, because there aren't many people who remember. It was a grand and glorious time as we sat around a grave and talked about Patrick. His son told me that as he was on his deathbed, that his father came out of the coma and said, Son, they don't need to applaud. Why are they applauding? And his son said he thought. He thought it was the oxygen mask that he was wearing, so he removed it. His father slipped into a coma, came out the second time without the mask, and said, Why are they applauding? They don't have to applaud. And then the last words that Pat spoke were these. It's the bride. It's the bride. It's all about the bride. I want to talk to you this morning about the church, the bride of Christ. I would prefer, being a guy and everything, to talk about the army of God and the fight. But God has this proclivity to talk about the bride of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. I've never been a bride, but I have seen a whole lot of brides. And when you're an old guy like me, you've done a whole lot of worship services. Have you ever been around a young man who's the groom, who's scared to death, and you're afraid he's going to faint? I can tell you the number of times I've said to those young men, son, they don't care about you. <laughs> you... You, you could show up naked and nobody would even notice. If you faint, nobody's going to pay any attention. She and her mother have been preparing this for a long, long time. And you have to be here because it's not a real wedding without some kind of groom. But nobody cares about you. So calm down and be at peace. But this morning, I want to... I want to talk to you about a groom who's never nervous, a groom who's perfect, a groom who's taking us corporately and making us his bride. Now, before we talk about that, I want to give you four things that you need to remember about the bride of Christ. The first thing you need to know about the bride of Christ is that she's really ugly. 
<laughs> she really is. If you read this passage in Ephesians, Paul says there's going to be a time, and that presupposes that it's not now, when the church is going to be without spot or wrinkle, without blemish. Paul said that because he looked at this bunch he was serving in Ephesus and the bunch he was serving in Corinth and he was saying they are a weird bunch. God's choices. I mean, let me tell you something, Augustine was right and he understood and you've heard it before. When Augustine said the church is a prostitute, but she's my mother. So the first thing you need to know about the church is that she is ugly. Are you aware that Paul said to Timothy that when you have elders in the church, they can't be a new Christian? Now, throughout the history of the church, people have taught that is because the elders need to be mature. They need to understand the scripture. They need to be able to teach. They need to have been around until they become very spiritual and very holy and very sanctified. You are very fortunate to be here this morning because I'm going to tell you the truth. That wasn't it at all. The Apostle Paul knew that if a new Christian became an elder and looked at the church and all that goes within the church, that new Christian would become a Buddhist. And so you've got to be around for a while. Let me tell you something. You're going to be committed to the church. You better be committed to people who are sinners. If you're going to be committed to the body of Christ, you're going to see division and misunderstanding. If you're going to be committed to the body of Christ, you've got to recognize that she's ugly. She's better. But she's ugly. And the scripture is so clear on that, you can't get away from it. But that's not all. The bride of Christ is not only ugly, she's also cherished. Note what Paul says, that husbands... You should love your wives as Christ. Is this weird? As Christ loved? Can you believe this? As Christ loved the church, the bride of Christ. I complained, Lord, she's a mess. And I am too. I got stuff in me, it's hard to love. And I'm having real problems loving them. How can you love them? They're selfish and they're mean and they're greedy and they're divisive. And he says, be quiet, son. That's my wife. That's my wife. She's cherished. God loves the bride. Listen, this is a great thing from uh, Richard Seltzer. He's a surgeon. The book is Mortal Lessons, The Notes on the Art of Surgery. And I'm reading from that book. Listen to this. I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be thus from now on. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, in order to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to swell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself? He and this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so generously, the young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, I say, it will. It's because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent, but the young man smiles. I like it, he says. I like it. It's, it's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze, unmindful. He bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I'm so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers, to show that the kiss still works. That's what Jesus has done. 
don't understand, but hanging spread eagle on crossbeams on the town garbage heap. He reached out to the wry mouths that are us, twisted his mouth to show that the kiss still works. Leave her alone. She's my wife. She's cherished. So the church is ugly, the bride, but she's also cherished. But thirdly, she's also fixable. I'm glad I'm not a pastor anymore. Because when I was a pastor, I really thought I could fix problems, and I couldn't. I can't tell you the number of times the older I got when I listened to people confess, and I knew it was my sin too. And I listened to them telling me about their broken hearts, and I was so privileged they would let me in on their secrets. But I would sit there and say, Lord, this is not fixable. I don't... I don't have any wisdom. I don't have any band-aids. I don't have any medicine. This is not fixable. And sometimes I would read, but someday it will be fixed. Someday it will be together. She's ugly. She's cherished, but it's fixable. And you're fixable, and I'm fixable. And thirdly, she is permanent. That's what the marriage supper of the Lamb is all about. I'm glad that you're a part of different ministries in this city, but listen to me, no matter how intelligent, no matter how effective, they're going to die. The church is not. I'm so pleased with Key Life and what God is doing, but that's not the church. That's parachurch, and it's going to die. Campus Crusade, Youth for Christ, Young Life. I'm so glad that God has raised them up, but he's going to put them down, but not the church. Because the church is the bride. I one time heard William Buckley interviewing Malcolm Muggeridge, and they were talking about Solzhenitsyn. And uh, Buckley asked Muggeridge, he said, do you think the world will ever create another Solzhenitsyn? And Buckley said, if the world were encased in concrete, there would be a crack, and out of the crack would grow a flower, and out of the flower, the voice of Solzhenitsyn. Maybe. But I'll tell you something I know on the basis of God's word. If the world were encased in concrete, there would be a crack, and out of the crack would grow a flower, and out of the flower, the voice of the terrible me. The voice of the church is bride. She's ugly. She's cherished. She's fixable. And she's permanent forever. Now, I want to draw three points from what I just told you. I'm going to do it very quickly. Uh, And the first thing I want you to note is that the church is not defined by what she is, but by what she will become. That's the 27th verse of the fifth chapter of Ephesians. The church is not defined by what she is, but by what she will become. As some of you know, I teach seminary students. I teach communications and preaching, homiletics. And I, and if you think this sermon is bad, you ought to have to listen to sermons as your career. Day in and day out, bad preachers because they're young and they haven't learned yet. And I'm supposed to teach them how to talk. And I remember a young man who came to me and said, Dr. Brown, tell me the truth. I'm grown. I can take it. I want you to really, I want you to really criticize what I'm saying because I want to get better. And I didn't say, but I wanted to. Son, if I told you how bad you really are, If I told you how awful you are, you'd leave this place, and I need your fees to pay my salary. And besides that, (coughs) and besides that, inside that shirt where the sweat is going to drip when you preach, inside that shirt, there may be another Charles Spurgeon There may be there another Whitfield. In that shirt, there may be another Billy Graham. So I listen to the sermons. Sometimes I want to laugh and sometimes I want to cry, but I listen to the sermons and I think someday, someday, this young man will be a great, great preacher. The church is like that. We're not defined by what we are. We're defined because he's promised by what we will become. And let me give you a principle that is so good. You will become what your heart defines. 
you will, and so will the church, become what our hearts define. I teach a 90-10 principle at the seminary. 10% of the people in the institutional church are neurotic and mean-spirited and critical and condemning, and often they're in leadership. And I'm not here. And I tell the students, if you preach to those 10%, and if you minister to that 10%, you'll get regular raises, the way will be smooth, and you will retire with nice benefits and go and die in a old age home for preachers. But if you preach to that 90%, the lambs of God, those who will encourage you and lift you up, if you reach out to them and you love them, they'll love you back. They'll make you free, and they have a view of the church that is so good. Reach out to them, and you'll go through, and I use the word carefully, hell. And if you survive on the other side, you'll have a church that will make a difference in your community and who will change the world. I've told you before, my daddy was drunk. He didn't come to church because he didn't think he was good enough. He would come when my brother or when I sang in a children's thing, and he would sit on the back row and he would leave. And he never said we were bad. He never said we were hypocrites. He never said anything that put us down. One time I said, Daddy, why don't you come to church? And he said, Son, and he was very quiet because I can't be there. I'm not good enough. I guess that's why I'm driven to say, you ought to see this bunch. None of them are. So you come on along, and the 90% throughout America and around the world say, let's have a church that opens its arms, draws in the people who have wounds and sins and fear. Then secondly, I want you to see, not only is the church not defined by what she is, but by what she will become, the church is motivated not by hunger, but by a banquet. Matthew 26, 29. I don't know about you, but every time we have communion and that passage is read, I want to dance. Jesus said, this is good wine, and this is a good supper, and you are good friends, but this is the last time I'm going to drink a glass of wine until someday I drink it anew my Father's kingdom at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Are you thirsty? If you're thirsty, logically, that presupposes there must be water somewhere. If you're hungry, it presupposes that there must be food somewhere. Jesus said that someday, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the hunger will be satisfied and the thirst will be quenched. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul, bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup. Fill it up. Make me whole. You're thirsty sometimes. Do you sometimes have a passion that the church be better than she is? I do. I do. I've been doing this a long time. Not only should you not see hot dogs being made if you like them, and not only should you not see uh, cigars being made if you like to smoke them, and not only should you not see the law being made if you want to live as a good citizen, you should not see church being made if you want to be a part of it. And I have a passion, and you do too. That's why I love you guys. A hunger and a thirst that the church be different. And the third point, not only is the church defined not by what she is, but what she will become, motivated not by hunger, but by banquet. And by the way, you will become what your heart not only defines, but desires. Thirdly, the church will be unified across some strange boundaries, not by a predilection, but by our invitation. Revelation 19.9, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Let me give you a principle. When God calls one, he calls a bunch. I always have people, you know, I get two kinds, the ones that criticize the church, and I want to say, you don't know nothing. I mean, you pagans, you criticize the church, you ought to be a part of it. I could tell you stuff that would curl your toes. I'll tell you something, I've seen the church, and I've seen what goes on in the church, but God has brought us together, porcupines, in the storm, because I need you desperately. And if, and if I cry, you have to taste salt. And if you're afraid, my hand ought to tremble. And when you rejoice, I ought to dance. And when you weep, I ought to weep with you because we are one, we are together, because someday we'll be like him. Don Miller's book, Blue Like Jazz, Bart's reading it. And if you see that around, you ought to get that book. Don works at Reed College, a pagan place in Portland, Oregon, and he hates jazz until he heard somebody play jazz. He said he was in downtown Portland, and he said there was a man playing a saxophone, down, cool jazz. And he said he watched the man close his eyes, and he didn't open his eyes for 15 minutes as he played jazz. And he said, I like jazz now. I used to think it didn't resolve, but now I love it. Because sometimes you have to see somebody loving something before you can love it too. I love you this much. The bride, the people of God, the covenant people of God. You know who my, and my favorite preacher is, is H.M. Ward. He's dead now. If we get him to preach here, we get a big crowd. <laughs> Uh, H.M. Ward is an Assemblies of God preacher, and I'm a Presbyterian, man. Presbyterians are not supposed to like those Pentecostal types, but I used to listen to him on the radio, and I had a chance to meet him soon after I got serious about God. I used to wear a collar in those days. I was quite proper, quite religious clergy. And uh, I went down to the little Pentecostal church where C.M. Ward was preaching, and I remember looking at them and saying, I'm glad I'm Presbyterian. I don't want to be like this. They raise their hands and they dance, and they say stuff I don't understand, but I'm here because they're part of me. And God said, Stephen, and that was the first time I ever started clapping in church. <laughs> C.M. Ward was preaching that night, and he called everybody forward because there weren't many people there. And he said, you're my family. My family kicked me out. And on his radio broadcast at the end of revival time, he would always say, there's a long, long altar, and there's room enough for you. And I can close my eyes, and hear C.M. Ward saying, the long, long altar. Well, let me take his imagery and spin it just a bit. There's a very long table, and it's big, and it's wide, and there's room enough for you. But before you accept the invitation, let me tell you some stuff that you ought to know. A lot of funny people are going to be there. There are going to be people speaking in tongues and raising their hands. There are going to be Episcopalians there. There are going to be some gays there, some that got straight because they repented, some who wanted to repent and couldn't, and some who cried out, God, I can't change. Can you, can you forgive me? Can you change me? And then they died. They're going to be there. There are going to be some prostitutes. Rahab is going to be there, and Mary's going to be there. And if you, if you don't like hanging out with people like that, you're not going to like this dinner. There are going to be some dispensationalists there for all you reform folks. <laughs> there are going to be some Lutherans there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be smelling like Jesus. I'm going to look down and say, I'm changing, and I'm different. If you don't like me, you don't want to come because I'm going to be there. They're going to be the enemies in the church who said bad stuff. They're going to be here. It's a big, big table. They're going to be people that were wrong. I mean, really wrong doctrinally, and they're going to be there too. They're going to be Methodists there. They really are. And Baptists, can you believe that? They're going to be Baptists there. 
They're going, to people, they're going to be people you thought were pagan who didn't know him, but who reached out in the darkness of their soul. They couldn't come with us because they couldn't be that religious. But they said, Jesus, if you're real, I need some help. And Robert Robinson's going to be there. He's the, he's the guy who wrote the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. And then he wandered and he left the faith for 40 years. He died that way. Wish I could have been there and talked to him. Robert's going to be there. There are going to be some people that we burned as heretics. They're going to be there. There are going to be a lot of weird people. And the biggest surprise is that if you know him, you will be there too. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Look over the world. Look at the church and the people of God. Someday, ugly now, cherish now, changing now, permanent forever at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and at that table, Jesus is going to welcome us and talk about his bride, and the bride's going to blush. And Jesus is going to sing, You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine, and nobody will ever take my sunshine away. And then we're going to get down. <laughs> we're going to eat a meal that will be better than any meal you ever had. And we're going to do it together. You think about that. I mean.